It's good to see you all here this morning. If you'd like to open to the book of Haggai, we're going to be in the book of Haggai this morning. Our Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus often spoke about himself as the most satisfying relationship that that you and I can have. Is that better? All right. In John chapter 4, for example, in John chapter 4, verses 13 through 14, he tells us that he is the the living water and that he who drinks of this water will will never thirst again. It will swell up to to everlasting life. There's, There's something about our relationship with Jesus that is just different from every other relationship that we have. In John chapter 6 and verses 33 to 35, John 6, 33 to 35, he calls himself the bread of God, the bread that God himself has sent down to us and that he who partakes of that will never hunger, will never thirst. There is a spiritual satisfaction that comes with your relationship with God. And the book of Haggai uses very similar language. Haggai chapter 2 and verse 7. In Haggai chapter 2, And in verse 7, this is a prophecy about Jesus. And it says in Haggai chapter 2 and verse 7, I will shake all nations and they shall come to the desire of all nations. That's, that's, uh, he's talking about Jesus there when he says the desire of all nations. Everybody craves Jesus. All nations, all people, that's what they're longing for. They don't always know it. They don't realize that's what they're looking for. And as they try to fill the emptiness in them, they use lots of other things. But what they're really looking for is he who is the desire of all nations, the one who can satisfy like nobody else can. And so we know from Scripture, Jesus satisfies us. But what is it? What is it about Jesus that makes him, that relationship, so different, so satisfying? That's what the book of Haggai is about. Haggai explains why Jesus, in two short chapters, why your relationship with Jesus is your first relationship, because there is no relationship like it. He starts in Haggai chapter 1 and verse 1. Haggai chapter 1 and verse 1, and it says there, In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Now that that tells us a little bit about who Haggai is. It's talking about that time period from Ezra chapter 1 to Ezra chapter 6. And so in your Bibles, from Ezra chapter 1 to Ezra chapter 6 describes the events that happened as the Israelites came back from Babylonian captivity. Do you remember when when Jerusalem fell the first time because Babylon came and destroyed it? And remember, they took people into captivity, people like Daniel. That's when they took Daniel into captivity. Well, about 70 years later, Zerubbabel, who's mentioned there in verse 1, and Jeshua brought some people back. They came back to Jerusalem, and they had one mission, rebuild the temple. It had been demolished, and their job was to go back and rebuild the temple. But it got hard, and at the end of Ezra chapter 4, it tells us they stopped building the temple. They, it got too difficult, and so they said, you know, we're just going to put a pause on that. We'll come back to it later. And that's when God sent Haggai. And so in verse 1, it tells us he went to encourage them to start building the temple again. Verse 2, thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says, the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. God is just repeating back to them what they are saying. The people are saying, it's just not time for that. This was our number one mission. This was our number one goal, but it got too hard. And so clearly, because it's hard, it's just not time for that. God says, that's what the people say. But verse 3, what does God say? Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and the temple to lie in ruins? The temple is in ruins, and they had gotten distracted. And chapter 1 is primarily about how the distractions of life, that that was well-timed, wasn't it? The distractions of life, 
Chapter 1 is primarily about how the distractions of life don't satisfy. They might seem like they do sometime, but at the end of the day, they are unfulfilling. They are unsatisfying. It says in verse 4, they had not just built houses, right? Not just little mud huts to hide from the weather in. They had built paneled houses, right? These are nice houses. These are, are fancy houses. They had, they had uh, he goes on to say in verse 5, he says, Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much, you bring in little. You eat but you don't have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. He who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. That's, they're working hard. They're working hard on their fields. They're working hard on their houses. They're working hard on their clothes, but they never seem to have enough. And isn't that the way? Sometimes we work and we work and we work, but it never feels like it's enough. It never feels satisfying. God says there's a reason for that. The distractions of this life can't satisfy. You remember Mark chapter 2? Mark chapter 2 and verses 18 through 19. In Mark chapter 2 and verses 18 through 19, it talks about the soils and it says there's a kind of seed that's put in the soil and when it comes up, it believes, it's excited, it rejoices, but then the thorns of life, the cares, the worries, the, the, the entertainment, he says, the, uh, the, um, the, the, the distractions of this life come up and they choke out the seed. They had, been surround, they had surrounded themselves with thorns and they were never having enough. This is the idea of Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11, it says, God has put eternity into our hearts. There is a longing and a desire for eternity. There is, if you will, a God-sized hole in each of our hearts, and we can put all kinds of things in it, but cars and houses and relationships will never fill a God-sized hole. There's only one who can fill that emptiness in a person's heart. And it's God. He's the only one who can. The distractions of life don't satisfy. He goes on then in verse 7 and says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple, that, it may take, that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. What is the solution when you've become distracted and your life seems unfulfilling, God's work, the work of the God, the labor that God has given us to do, Jesus is the most satisfying relationship that you could ever have. But if you are not in God's work, you are not benefiting from that relationship because to God, relationship is about laboring together. Fellowship is not so much about food and laughter, although those things are good, as it is about laboring together. Paul talks about that in the book of Philippians, and when he talks about fellowship and laboring, it's always in the work of the gospel. Work for God is where satisfaction is found. He goes on in verse 12, and he talks about the Zerubbabel and, and, and Joshua. With all the remnant of the people, it says, They obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. And the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the presence of the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. Now, they were a part of God's covenant before they were doing God's work, but in a way, he wasn't really with them because they were putting their own lives first, because they were putting their own houses and their own bellies first. This is very similar to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28 and verses 19 through 20, he says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you unto the end of the ages. Who did Jesus say he would be with? Those who are doing the work. Those who are doing the work. And so the same problem was happening in Haggai. And when they started the work, God says in verse 13, I am with you. 
with you. When the people get to the work, they found the satisfaction that they were looking for. Now, as it opens up in chapter 2, as it opens up in chapter 2, it tells us in the seventh month, on the 21st of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai to the pro- Haggai the prophet. Now, that, that is significant, that day, because the seventh month and the 21st day is when they would have been celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. And you can read about that in Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 34. It talks about this. But that seventh month and the 21st day was actually the very last day of the, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, or some call it the Feast of Booths. It's that feast where they would come out of their homes, and just like they did in the wilderness for 40 years, they would set up tents, and they would memorialize, they would remember how the people lived for 40 years. Now, that was so that they could appreciate what they had, right? Have you ever been camping and it didn't go so well, and when you got home you were just so relieved to be back in your air conditioning with your refrigerator? And, you know, it's, it's, they would go out, into, uh, out of their houses, they would set up the tents, and they could see their houses, and for a week they lived that way so they could remember what they had in the wilderness was not as good as what God gave us when he gave us the promised land. It helped to increase their appreciation. And so on the very last day of that feast, God sends a message to them. It says in verse 2, Speak now to Zerubbabel and to Joshua and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? In comparison with it, is this not in your eye as nothing? The, The first temple is the one that Solomon built, and it was magnificent. It was glorious. It was beautiful and big. The second temple didn't look like that. If you go back to the book of Ezra, Ezra chapter 3 and verse 12. In Ezra chapter 3 and in verse 12, we can see their response. It says, Ezra 3, 12, But many of the priests and the Levites and the heads of the fathers' houses, old men who had seen uh, the first temple, They wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this temple was laid before their eyes. The ones who could remember it, they were probably in their 80s or 90s, the ones who could remember it wept because they said it's just, it's not going to be the same. It's not going to be as big. It's not going to be as glorious. And so in Haggai chapter 2 and in verse verse 3, he's saying those who can remember it, doesn't it seem like nothing to you? And they're sitting out in their tents where they have nothing, and they're thinking about the temple and thinking it's nothing. But he says in verses 4 and 5, Just like Joshua brought the people into the land and did great things, we're going to do great things with this temple. Notice verse 4, he says, Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you. Notice again, Who is God with? Those who work in his kingdom, says the Lord of hosts. According to verse 5, the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. What we're doing may not seem very big sometimes, but God knows how to do great things from very little. You think about Jesus with the, the, the bread and the fish, you know, very little bread and fish. What could God do with very little bread and fish? What we're doing may not seem very big sometimes, but God can do great things with very little if we will just work. You might say, well, I, I, I don't feel like I, I can because I, I don't feel like I have enough skills or enough talents. What you have is enough. God can do great things with very little. You might say, I, I just don't, I don't have enough time. What you have is enough. God can do great things with very little. And God was going to do a lot more than they realized. He goes on in verse 6. For thus says the Lord of hosts, Once more, it is a little while, and I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations. Now, when you see, the Bible uses this several times, the idea of shaking all nations. Shaking reminds us of earthquakes. Earthquakes. 
And so it, whenever you see that phrase, you find it in the book of Daniel, you'll find it in the book of Revelation, you'll find it in the book of Hebrews. That phrase is talking about the destruction of one uh, nation in order to replace it with a new nation. Notice that at the end of chapter 2, chapter 2 and verse 21, it kind of explains this. Chapter 2 and verse 21, uh, he was speaking to Zerubbabel and it said, I will shake heaven and earth. That's that same phrase. And then he goes on to describe what that looks like. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them. The horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. That's When it talks about shaking heaven and earth, it's talking about removing one kingdom to replace a new kingdom. And so when he talks about it in chapter 2 and in verses 6 and 7 in relation to the temple, we know he's not talking about physical kingdoms, is he? Because we're talking about temples. He is talking about spiritual kingdoms. When did God shake heaven and earth to remove one spiritual kingdom and replace it with a new spiritual kingdom? That's what happened in Acts chapter 2. That's when the old covenant was done away with, when Jesus died on the cross, and when the new covenant was brought in with power by the Holy Spirit and by the apostles. He's talking about the second temple, but more, that is a shadow of this temple, of what the New Testament calls the church. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11 Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11 calls it a temple that is not made with hands. It's made by God. It's a spiritual temple. He's talking about you and me. And so he says, I will shake all nations and they shall come, verse 7, to the desire of all nations. Isn't that what happened? Eventually, the doors of the kingdom were opened to all nations and, and people came from all over because people from all over are seeking the desire of all nations. They are seeking the one relationship that can satisfy. They may not know it yet, but what they're looking for is Jesus Christ. And he says, I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. And the glory of this latter temple, talking about the church, shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace says the Lord of hosts. This time would come. This time is here. And you know, our mission hasn't changed. Our mission is exactly the same as their mission was. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19. Ephesians chapter 2 and in verse 19. Paul is writing in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19 about our mission as the church. And he says, now therefore, Ephesians 2, 19, you are no longer strangers and foreigners. That's the desire of all nations is open to every nation. We can all come into this. He says, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. The household of God, that's what they called the temple. He's saying we, we are members of the spiritual temple. Verse 20, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, this is the foundation the apostles and prophets built. This is, Jesus is the cornerstone that they based all the New Testament off of, and so this is our foundation. And he says in verse 21, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows. Now, have you ever seen a building grow? He's not talking about a real building. The whole building fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. He's talking about the church. Our mission has not changed. Zerubbabel's number one goal, go back and rebuild the temple Our number one purpose, this temple to God, the people of God, the church, is a a temple that never is completed, right? It's construction, just like they have in Dallas-Fort Worth. It's always under construction. We are always under construction because there is always more that we can learn. There is always more of our character that we can change to become more like Christ. And there are always more souls 
who are white for the harvest and who needed to be added to this body, added to this temple. We are a temple that is never completed until Jesus Christ himself comes back because we have work to do. And so our, t- our mission is the same as the rubble And sometimes we let ourselves get distracted. We let ourselves put our mortgages and our our kids' soccer games before the work of the church. We let ourselves put our entertainment and the things of this life before the work of the church. And we wonder, why do I feel so empty? Why do I feel so unsatisfied with my life? It's because we've taken the secondary things, the things of this world, and we've built ourselves paneled houses and we're putting money into pockets that have holes, and we're, we're missing out on the greatest relationship and the greatest work that Christ died to give for us, to, to us. Our mission hasn't changed. He goes on then in chapter 2 and verse 10. Haggai chapter 2, and in verse 10, it's only God's work that satisfies. And likewise, it's only God's king that can satisfy us. He says in verse 10, he's going to ask some questions. He says, On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Now ask the priest concerning the law, saying, If one carries holy meat in the fold of his garment, and with the edge he touches bread or stew, wine or oil or any food. So what what, what he's wanting you to picture this in your mind. You see, picture the priest, and he has some holy meat. He's folded it up in his clothing, and he's walking through, and some of it has kind of stuck out of his clothing. As he walked past the table, it touched other food that is on the table Food that's not holy, that's not set aside for, for God. It says, if one carries it, when, uh, if it touches, will it become holy? Will that stew or that bread become holy if holy meat touches it? And so the priest answered at the end of the verse, no. It's kind of like this. If you wash your hands and you get them really, really clean, and then you go outside and you shove them in mud, what happens? The mud does not get clean your hands get dirty. Something clean doesn't make unclean things cleaner. Dirty things make clean things dirty, right? That's what they're talking about here. The holy does not make the unholy clean. And Haggai says in verse 13, if one who is unclean because of a dead body touches any of these, will it be unclean? And the priest answered and said, yes. If you stick your hands in the mud, And then you go and you put your hands on your wife or your husband's face. Now they're dirty too, right? You've just spread the dirt around. And so he says in verse 14, So is this people, and so is this nation before me, says the Lord. And so is every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. They had become polluted. They had turned to the idols of the world. They had turned to the sins of the world. And he says there's nothing that they can do to make themselves holy. They might have holy meat, but that's not going to make them holy. They might have holy bread, but that's not going to make them holy. They can take a bath, but it isn't going to change their spiritual condition. This is the idea of Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22. In Hebrews chapter 9 and in verse 22, he says that, Only the shedding of blood, and in particular, not the blood of bulls and goats, but the blood of Christ, can cleanse us of our sins. Only God, only the King who shed his blood for us, can cleanse us of those sins. We need that King. Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6. Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6, he says that even our righteousness is like filthy rags on our own. We cannot become clean. We need this king. And so he goes on in verse 15 and he says, Can carefully consider from this day forward, from before stone was laid upon stone in the temple of the Lord, since those days when, and he describes how things had gotten too expensive. Verse 17, I struck you with blight and mildew and hail and the labors of your hands, yet you did not turn to me, says the Lord. Consider now from this day forward, now that they had begun to do the work, consider it, 
verse 19, is the seed still in the barn? As yet the fine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have not yielded fruit, but from this day I will bless you. He had been trying to get their attention, trying to get them to repent, trying to get them to do the work and build the temple, and as long as they did not repent, they were still unclean and they were unsatisfied. But when they repented and begun to do the work, he says, from this day, I will bless you. Have you noticed the the connection that he makes here? A lot of times we make repentance about us. I have sinned and I'm repenting so that I can be clean. That's a part of it. So I can go to heaven. But he says there's more to it than that. Repentance is not just about changing to stop doing something. Repentance is about recognizing that the reason why I sinned is because I was focused on the wrong thing. I was distracted. I've got to focus on the work. It's not just repent and be clean. It's repent and work. It's repent and work to be satisfied. You can sin every day and repent every day, but if you are not turning your attention to God's work, you're just going to stay in that cycle of sin and repent, sin and repent. You're not really going to grow, and you will never feel the satisfaction that God so much wants to give to you. And so he finishes then in verses 20 to 23 where he identifies this king. Now, we know who it is. They, of course, don't know Christ. They don't know who it is. He's going to give them a clue. It says in verse 20, Again, the word of the Lord came to Haggai on that same day. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake heaven and earth. There's going to be from one kingdom to another. And we read about all the things that would happen. And he says in verse 23, In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, says the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you. Now that sounds like Zerubbabel is the Messiah that we're looking for. Zerubbabel is not the Messiah. He's a shadow of the Messiah. He's a type of the Messiah. Let's look at how he does this. First of all, turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 22. Jeremiah chapter 22. He calls Zerubbabel his signet ring. And in Jeremiah 22, in verse 24, Jeremiah 22, 24, we can get a sense of what that means. He says in Jeremiah 22, in verse 24, As I live, says the Lord, though Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, this is one of the last kings of Judah, but he's talking about the king, right? Though, Though this king of Judah were the signet ring on my right hand, yet I would pluck you off. What he's talking about there is a signet ring is something a king wears and he can stamp a piece of paper and that makes it law. You have to do whatever the signet ring has stamped. And so he calls the king his signet ring. And so when he tells the rebel, I will make you a signet ring, he's saying, I will make you king. Now the truth is, Zerubbabel himself was never actually a king. He was always just the governor of Judah. But this prophecy would come true, much as it did for Abraham with his prophecies, in the future through Christ. It would be fulfilled uh, further down the line. And so notice then Matthew chapter 1, where we see the lineage of Christ. And in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 6, it says that Jesse begot David the king. Here's the lineage of Christ, and this is when the kings that Christ comes from begin. And if you jump down to verse 12, it says, after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begot Shiltiel. We've heard that name a lot this morning. And Shiltiel begot Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the type of Christ because Christ was going to come from him. You get down all the way to verse 16, and it says, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Christ is in the lineage of Zerubbabel, and so that king was going to come through Zerubbabel's blood, and it would be Christ. Christ is the king that cleanses. Christ is the king that satisfies. The only authority that is truly satisfying to serve is the king who can clean your sins. There is no other authority on earth who can make promises and keep all of them like Christ does. There is no other authority on earth who cares about you like Christ does. There is no president. There is no governor. There is no one on earth who is worthy of your devotion like Christ is because he's the only one who can bring you that satisfaction. 
Haggai's point is this. If you are being cleansed by the true king, and if you are working for his glory, you will have a satisfaction, a peace that surpasses understanding, like, like is unknown to the rest of the world. And anything else, no matter how much, will always fall short. I want to look at one more verse this morning. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse 10. The entire book of Ecclesiastes is really about this concept. But notice how Solomon describes it in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 10 through 11. He says, Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. If I saw it and I wanted it, I had it. He says, I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor. If he tried it, he wanted to to plant a vineyard, it succeeded. He wanted to build a building, it succeeded. Everything he tried, he was good at, and it worked, and this was my reward from all my labor. I looked on all the works that my hands had done, and on the labor which I had doiled, toiled, and indeed all was vanity and grasping for the wind. There was no profit under the sun. When you put your house and, and your family, when you put the things of this life before God, Solomon tried it, and he can tell you how it works out. It fails. It falls short every time. And that's why he ends the book, chapter 12, verse 13, with this. Fear God and keep his commandments. Have a relationship with God and do his work. For this is man's, sometimes, this is man's second, third, this is man's all all that we are created to do. Have a relationship with this king and do his work. We're here to help you. If you haven't been doing his work, if there's been other things that have been put first in your life, you can repent today and have a new life going forward. If you don't know yet if you were in Christ how to become a Christian so that you can work for God, We are here today to sit down, we'll open up your Bible, and we'll just show you exactly what God says about if there is anything at all that we can help you with. We ask that you come forward now as we stand and as we sing.